drug offender, and I manage outpatient re uh, have services here at the hospital. And today I'll be covering uh, physical therapy for cervical dystonia. Uh, my objectives are to describe dystonia, um, review some of the relevant anatomy and types of cervical dystonia, and then discuss the concept of sensory deficits in dystonia and how they can play a role in the rehab process. Uh, review some components of the evaluation and treatment from a rehab perspective, and finally review a home program. Cervical dystonia is a painful condition in which your neck muscles contract involuntarily, causing your head to twist, bend, or turn to one side. It's a rare disorder, but it is, it is the third most common movement disorder behind central tremor and Parkinson's disease. It most often occurs in middle-aged, those with a family history, and affects women a little bit more than men. Symptoms begin gradually and then reach a point where they don't get substantially worse. There is no cure for cervical dystonia, however, it sometimes resolves without treatment. But sustained remissions are uncommon, as the problem will resurface at some point during one's life. In addition to uh, exhausting and disabling neck pain, the involuntary muscle contractions associated with cervical dystonia can spread to the face, jaw, arms, and trunk. And because of the strain on the cervical spine, people who have cervical dystonia may experience headaches or develop bone spurs that may reduce the amount of space uh, for the nerves in the spine. This can cause tingling, numbness, and weakness in the arms and, and hands. Cervical dystonia is thought to be an underdiagnosed and un undertreated condition. Currently, as probably everyone here knows, botulinum toxin is the treatment of choice for cervical dystonia. Injecting Botox into the affected muscles often reduces the signs and symptoms of cervical dystonia. Surgery can also be appropriate in a few cases. And lastly, physical therapy could be an option in conjunction with the aforementioned strategies. In a survey filled out by a couple hundred Swedish patients um, uh, with uh, cervical dystonia, it was noted that a combination of PT and Botox was most effective. And many participants stated that there was a need for more physical therapy as PT could possibly be an overlooked modality in the management of cervical dystonia. So here's a list of some of the impairments associated with cervical dystonia. Range of motion can be impaired because of the twisting and positioning of the neck. Strength can be impaired because of the disuse in positioning of the muscles. Postural control is impaired because of the inaccurate sensory processing between the body's sensory system and the muscles and joints used to control posture. Patients might feel unsteady or they'll demonstrate excessive swaying and standing. That same mechanism can cause incoordination and problems with graphesthesia, which is the ability to identify a number drawn on the skin, and stereognosis, which is the ability to identify an object uh, by touch without seeing it. So like picking up a key or, or a nail, you wouldn't know what that is. Proprioception, which is your ability to sense your body's position in space, is also impaired. And it just doesn't affect the neck in people with cervical dystonia. For example, individuals with cervical dystonia can have a significant problem identifying or sensing the position of the fingers compared to individuals without cervical dystonia. And it turns out that a physical therapist can treat these problems we would consider these impairments that we would attempt to treat in the clinic. Now, why are there so many impairments, and how might this be happening? One way to think about this is that sensory input doesn't get processed correctly. So all the information coming into your body isn't getting interpreted correctly by the brain. Using proprioception as an example, the brain would typically be quite sensitive to any any uh, stimulation to the finger. <laughs> this idea of how sensitive a body part is, is a function of the receptor density in that part of the body. This is represented by something called the homunculus. That guy right there. Which is a visual, even artistic, representation of the amount of sensory attention uh, devoted to a particular body part. As you can see from the homunculus picture, the hand has a lot of receptors, so any sensation on the hand gets a lot of attention in our brains, which is why the hand is so large on that, that picture. 
But if the message from the hand to the corresponding part of the brain is altered, you might get something called smudging. This is represented by the picture to your right. Note the difference between the two pictures. The one on the right is a bit hazy in the hand. It's hard to differentiate what a finger is and isn't, or which finger is which. Whereas the other hand is perfectly clear. No smudging in that hand. It's perfectly clear and well-defined. So smudging refers to the changes in the brain that cause messages from the body to overlap once they get to the brain, making it difficult to orient yourself to movement and to various sensations. This manifests in the many different ways you saw in the previous slide. There are several main types of uh, cervical dystonia. Torticollis, where the chin is pulled towards the shoulder, is the most common type. Uh, lateral collis, where the ear is pull pulled towards the shoulder. Retrocollis, where the chin is pulled straight up. And anterior collis, where the chin is pulled straight down. These are the major forms, but many combinations can also occur. They can kind of overlap on each other. As you can see, a lot of muscles are involved in cervical dystonia. Not only the ones twisting or turning the head and neck, but also uh, muscles involved with the secondary problems uh, associated with, say, bad posture. For example, the shoulder girdle uh, and trunk muscles can tighten or cause pain. The most common form of cervical dystonia is spasmodic torticollis. It causes the neck to twist away from midline, either to the left or right side. The muscles most commonly involved have been marked with an X. They are splenius capitis, the upper fibers of the trapezius, the levator scapula uh, on the same side, and the sternocleidomastoid on the opposite side. The second most common type is lateral collis, uh, where the head is pulled to one side down to the shoulder. The muscles most responsible are splenius capitis, scalene trapezius, levator scapula, and sternocleidomastoid on the same side. <clears throat> Anterocollis is excessive neck flexion. Uh, patients are unable to hold their head up in a normal posture and may have a superimposed lateral collis or torticollis. The chin gets pulled down uh, towards the chest by both, the sternocleido by both sternocleidomastoids and scalenes also marked by the X's. This is relevant because it causes many problems with swallowing, speaking, and vision. Retrocollis, which causes the head to be pulled backwards, is caused by abnormal activity in the trapezius and splenius muscles. In the evaluation, we'll look at a few things. Of course, there will always be a subjective assessment, which is basically the patient's story or the history of the problem that we'll be addressing. After that, we can examine your movement, sensation, strength, and functional mobility, which encompasses the objective part of the evaluation. Our objective findings will allow us to prepare for the treatment. An evaluation starts with a subjective assessment to gather information about the patient's history. Relevant information like when the last Botox injection was and how it affected the patient's symptoms is documented. Is there variability in your daily routine? For example, do they eat at the same place at the same time? Do they use the same computer in the same room every day? Is there a pattern? Can this repetitive pattern result in smudging? It's possible. Injecting variability into the environment or to the body in people with sensory integration problems can decrease the smudging and improve outcomes. We might ask about trauma, but we need to be careful. We might want to consider the best time to ask this question. It could depend on the rapport uh, that we develop with the patient. A really stressful or traumatic event uh, can often precede cervical dystonia. So we need to be careful of this and make sure we address it at the appropriate time. Understanding threats and danger signals are important because they can amplify cervical dystonia. Threats and fears can precede the therapy episode or even happen during it. For example, if someone is uh, walking better as a result of the treatment, that could introduce, even though it's a good outcome, it could introduce new fears that may need to be managed. The patient may explain um, that now that she's walking, she's scared. There could be a lot of danger associated with that in her mind, uh, whether they're physical fears uh, because of the demands of walking, or psychological or social fears of walking that one could have based on the new opportunities this level of function gives you. So now, 
all of a sudden you're kind of re-engaging uh, with your friends and getting out in the environment again. In light of all this, an understanding that a support system can be valuable. Their lifestyle choices can be important as well. Are they exercising, eating right, or getting enough sleep? We know that all these matter in our, our health profile and how we present on a day-to-day -day basis, especially sleep. Their lifestyle choice, um, lastly, are they committed to making a change? This one's incredibly important. If patients are more committed to comply and put in the work, they'll most likely succeed in being consistent with the treatment plan. Now, of course, you want the treatment plan to, to be successful, but really the first step is being motivated enough to engage in the treatment plan. It's huge. Um, there's actually a study out there that shows those who have faith that they can complete or participate in the treatment plan will, in fact, engage in it and be consistent with it. If they don't have the confidence that they'll engage in the treatment plan, they simply won't do it. That may seem obvious, but um, it is kind of an interesting uh, interesting anecdote, interesting situation. We see that all the time in the clinic. Patients come in and they outright say, I'm not doing this at all once I get out of here. I just want to come in the two days per week or three days per week, and that's it. You're only in the clinic for a couple hours a week. Could be weekly, it could be for several weeks, but then again, 23 hours of the day, you're at home, out in the environment, with your friends. Um, there's ample opportunity to, to exercise or do some of the things that we might educate. So, and really that's going to ensure the best outcome. So finding that motivation, having that confidence to engage in that treatment plan. And it's like the whole treatment plan, the comprehensive treatment plan, not just physical therapy, of course, but, but everything. <clears throat> These are some of the sensory tests we'll be administering during the objective part of the exam. Uh, vibration is tested with a tuning fork. Basically determine if you can feel the sensation and compare sides. Proprioception is tested by moving a body part and asking the patient to identify the direction of movement with their eyes closed. People with cervical dystonia can have uh, poor, well, do have poor head control. I don't know where my head is, could be a common complaint, aside from the pain or the range of motion issues. The head reposition accuracy test is performed by sitting perpendicular to a wall, 90 centimeters away. The patient is then asked to turn his or her head with the eyes closed, then return to the starting position and record where the eyes end up. The head repositioning accuracy test will test the patient's sensory motor integration. The goal is to return the head to a memorized neutral starting position after actively moving the head with the eyes closed. It's expressed um, by joint position error in degrees. Patients with cervical dystonia uh, show larger joint position errors than those without. They often overshoot the target. Assess the joint position error and the quality of movement. You could test it in any plane. After the testing, you could turn it into a treatment by performing the same movement for repetitions or for a certain amount of time. Two-point discrimination test is used to assess if the patient is um, able to identify two close points on a small area of skin. These are great assessments for focal dystonias. The chart includes some normative data to use as a reference, so you can see uh, the back of the hand is a good place to check because of the uh, proprioceptive issues we talked about with the hand earlier. And then, of course, you do have some norm data for the neck as well. <clears throat> the subjective visual vertical test assesses whether or not a patient can orient their head vertically. You can always determine where vertical is because of gravity's effect on the vestibular system, even with your eyes closed. If the patient has a vestibular-like feeling or complaint, this test can be valuable. Uh, there are several vestibular complaints that are common. So someone could have something called disequilibrium, which is kind of like a, like a slanting feeling. Like you just kind of feel like you're falling off. Uh, vertigo, of course, is spinning. And then dizziness. Dizziness is kind of like a feeling that you're, you're kind of off or woozy or hazy. Things just don't feel quite right. So those are kind of three distinctions with those particular complaints. And sometimes that gets confused. People confuse dizziness for vertigo and Disequilibrium often isn't something that folks consider. <clears throat> Mental rotation, stereognosis, and graphesthesia are more sensory tests that can be done for cervical dystonia, as they all can be impaired. Mental rotation is, is, uh, can be described as the ability to rotate objects mentally. Stereognosis is the perception of depth or three-dimensionality by the senses, usually in reference to the ability to uh, perceive the form of sol uh, solid objects by touch without vision. 
Graphesthesia is the ability to recognize writing on the skin purely by sensation or touch. Balance can also be impaired in patients with cervical dystonia. Uh, dystonia. So assessing it can give us uh, valuable information about their fall risk, the types of challenges they may have as it relates to balance, and can help design a treatment. Romberg is a quick balance assessment that tests the static uh, standing balance. The test is conducted by having the patient stand on the floor, preferably with their shoes off and feet together, with a narrow base of support. First with eyes open, then with the eyes closed. Then the test is repeated in a tandem type stat, so one foot in front of the other, uh, for up to 30 seconds. Times recorded as a baseline, if they, say, lose their balance up to that 30 seconds, uh, and then we can check for improvement over time, of course. Uh, the modified CAT-SIB is the modified clinical test of sensory integration and balance. It has value in determining which, uh, which balance system in the body is helping or impeding your balance. The test is designed to assess how well an individual is using certain systems in the body when balancing, and how well you compensate when one or more of those systems are compromised. Once we find an area of compromise, we can move right into treatment. The systems you would use to or the uh, systems, not symptoms. The systems you would use to uh, balance include vision, the somatosensory system, which is basically proprioception, so that kind of joint awareness in space piece of that puzzle, and the vestibular system, which is really associated with balance. Right. The input from all of those systems is integrated in the brain and then sent out to the eyes and all the muscles in your body so that you can balance. The test has four parts, which includes variations of standing balance with the eyes open and closed and on a firm or soft surface for up to 30 seconds. If you open your eyes, change your arm position, move your feet or require uh, any kind of assistance, it's considered a fail. Um, if you sway during the test, that's okay, but that's something to document just so you can make a note of that. Perhaps the quality of the, the balance would improve over time. Uh, the mini best is a 14 item uh, test that assesses dynamic balance in neural populations as opposed to static balance. It has four sections. It looks at uh, anticipatory postural adjustments in response to functional movements like standing on one leg or up on your toes. Reactive postural control looks at your corrective strategies when placed in a situation where you could lose your balance and route to a fall. For example, do you step, sway, squat, or just fall? Sensory orientation is assessed with static movements in multiple uh, situations, like the cat sim. And dynamic gait is assessed by walking under several different challenging conditions, like over obstacles, uh, pivoting, and changing the speed of your walking. As with all these, we can determine the problems and treat accordingly with various activities uh, in the PT clinic. Uh, 